So back to our paper, where we're saying, you know, do we have this idea of loss aversion creeping into financial markets in the form of the disposition effect? We have some awesome data that we can look at to try to answer this question. And we said, in order to answer this question, it's okay. In order to answer this question, it doesn't necessarily just make sense to look at the number of gains and losses that were sold. Because if we're in a universe where the population of stocks just has more winners than losers, like that's not really a fair comparison, let's normalize and let's think about realized gains as a fraction of potential realized gains. And let's think about realized losses as a fraction of total potential losses. And say, rather than asking, is the number of gains sold larger than the number of losses sold? Ask, is the proportion of gains that get sold larger than the proportion of losses that get sold? And that's our, you know, at the end of the day, that's our, our question or our test statistic or, you know, the thing that we're doing that difference of means t-test on. Which brings us to your discussion question. So here, gave you some obviously hypothetical data. I said, no, let's just go through a simple exercise to make sure that we're all talking about the same thing, that we all know what we're talking about, that we're not misrepresenting anything without necessarily realizing it. Let's just make sure we're all on the same page. So I gave you three different investors. And obviously, there's only one current stock price. Because, hey, if I'm Microsoft, I only have one price. My price doesn't depend on, you know, you don't have a different price for Microsoft than you do. That wouldn't make any sense. So we just have one current price. But then we have the buy prices for each of the individual investors. And obviously, those buy prices could be different depending on when the person bought the stock. So the first question, I just said, suppose that investor one sold stocks A, C, and F. How many winners were sold? Let's just categorize each one of them. We'll start off that way. So stock A, he bought at five, it's now at four. That's a loser. All right. Stock B, he bought at 20, it's now at 22. That's a winner. This is an easy exercise, right? And notice we're not, you know, we're going with what was described in the paper and the metrics that were described in the paper. We're not keeping track of by how much something is a loser or a winner. We're just putting it into one of those two categories. All right. Stock C, he bought at 40, it's at 45. That's a winner. Now I can't get winner, winner, chicken dinner out of my head. <laughs> this is my inner monologue while I'm talking to you, just, just FYI. Stock D, was 25, went to 28, winner. Stock E, bought at 10, it's now at 8. Stock F, bought at 35, it's now at 40. Winner. So what we have in this very simple six stock world is that for investor one, we have four winners and two losers. Right? And this is illustrating what I was talking about, where we're likely to be in a world where the number of winners in your portfolio is just higher than the number of losers. So if we were to look at this and say, you know, oh, well, he sold two winners and one loser or whatever, that in and of itself could be misleading, which is why we asked the second part of this question. So we sold A, C, and F. So this guy got sold, this guy got sold, and this guy got sold. So we sold two winners and one loser. Well, this guy sold more winners than losers, right? Disposition effect, right? Ah, I tricked some of you. I'm very believable. I have a very honest face. She's like, yeah, you said it, obviously. Yeah, that's going to be right. Tricked you. Because the whole point here is that even if we are picking stocks randomly to sell, wouldn't we on average pick twice as many winners as losers? just because there are twice as many winners as losers in our universe, or in specifically investor one's universe. 
So we look at this, and my question here is potentially a little bit unclear. I didn't know how to do the wording better than this. I said, is this direct evidence for the disposition effect? And I meant just saying, eh, two winners, one loser. Is that enough information to determine whether this individual exhibits the disposition effect? That answer is no, because we need to also know how many winners and losers were in this investor's universe. But that's exactly that point. That's illustrating the importance of calculating this proportion of gains realized and proportion of losses realized. Mm -hmm. So let's do that. I'm now regretting switching to a new slide because we're going to have to kind of start over. But we can just do that really easily, right? Loser, winner, 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 loser, winner. And then we can do this for the other investors as well. And the reason that I put multiple investors in here was to make sure we knew what we were talking about when we were reading the paper. And the paper has this one measure of PGR and one measure of PLR. All right. Let's see, investor two, bought at three, it's now at four, we got a winner. Loser. Loser. Winner. This is very helpful to me, thank you. Winner. Loser. Loser. I would manage to do this wrong, it's a lot of pressure being up here, so this is good. Okay, so investor three, stock A is a? Loser. Loser. Mm -hmm. Loser. So we can see here, you know, investor one had four winners and two losers to pick from. Investor two has a universe that's more evenly matched, three winners and three losers. And then investor three also has a universe that's more evenly matched, three winners and three losers. Okay. So, again, we said that we sold stock A. Stock C and stock F. So we need to now calculate PGR and PLR. So the proportion of gains realized is just the number of winners sold. How many winners were sold? Six. Six, right? This is the point, and this is getting back to the, the point that I'm making, that when we're calculating PGR and PLR, it's aggregated over all investors. And that wasn't necessarily as clear as it could have been in the paper, but at least at that initial calculation, that's what's happening. Mm -hmm. So I did it separately for each three investors? For the purpose of your discussion question, you're great, well, like, I don't care about that so much that this is giving us an opportunity to have that conversation so that I can reinforce that as per the paper, like, it, I'm trying, the point of this exercise is to explain to you what the paper is doing. That, you know, your, your letter grade at the end of the semester is not going to be noticeably, be noticeably affected by, oh, I did this this way. But it gives me an opportunity to say, oh yeah, that thing that you did, because you weren't necessarily sure what was going on, that's not what was being done in the paper, this is what's being done in the paper, it gives an opportunity to reinforce. In the paper, do they literally label it as WRL for everyone? Like in the, like whatever statistical program they're using, I don't know, but they would have binary indicators. So I don't know if it's literally a W and an L, but it would be like, is this a winner and then have a one or a zero? Is this a loser and have a one or a zero? But like, what, um, something would be classified as a winner if you'd held a stock for five years and it had only gone up 50 cents, and that's not a winner. So that, and that's part of the point that's important to keep in mind as you're reading this, understand what is actually being done, right? Because, and again, this actually comes back to the conversation about the reference point specification. Because one guess about someone's reference point, if they're making a very naive calculation, is to just say, well, something's a winner if it's literally above the price that I bought it at. And 
you're taking issue with that is totally reasonable because you're like, I as a person who can do math and is taking economics courses, you're like, well, wait a minute. If I haven't at least cleared the risk-free rate on this stock, I don't perceive that as a winner. For you, you're pro then that's probably right. For the more sophisticated investors, their reference point specification or how they're psychologically feeling might actually be somewhat different. That we made a very naive assumption here that anything that had gone up in absolute terms is a winner and vice versa. And there's a decent amount of evidence that people do behave that way. One example that comes to mind is that of house prices, that people seem unwilling to sell their house for less than they paid for it. And that finding seems insensitive to how long they've held the house. And if it was something where people were making a more nuanced reference point specification, we would expect the behavior to be somewhat different depending on how long people had held the house. And it doesn't, that's, that's not necessarily borne out in the data. So for most people, and again, on a psychological level rather than a financial level, it probably is likely that they're thinking that simply, especially if you consider the disposition effect is already assuming that people are acting based on psychological instinct rather than math. If you're already sitting there doing the financial calculations, you're probably somewhat out of that psychological realm to begin with. So yeah, literally the calculations are just this binary winner and loser and doesn't factor in the, the time that you've held at the expected rate of return. It's basically doing a an accounting win and loss versus what we would consider an economic profit or an economic win or loss. Luckily for us, that makes it easier. And once you read it through the paper, there are some robustness checks and things like that that do happen. So this is the primary calculation, but then the author goes through and makes sure that we're not only seeing the result in this one case, so we can try other things, incorporate other factors sort of like what you're talking about and that the result is somewhat robust to that. But yeah, this is super easy. It's just six over six plus, well, how many, how many paper wins were there? Three, one, two, four. three, four. There's a fourth one over here, you might not have seen it. Okay. So we get six over 10. I would like to think that I did that on purpose, so it's something that's actually easily dividable. And we get a PGR that's 0.6. But notice, again, the point of this is that when doing the proportion of gains realized, we're aggregating over all of the investors. And that would still be true. This would still be done in this way, even if the investors sold different numbers of stocks, held different numbers of stocks, and so on. I just simplified this so that we had the same six stocks in all the investors' portfolios and that they sold the same stocks. Just to make things not too annoying for you, but this same logic would extend if that were not the case. In addition, and we'll talk about why this is potentially problematic, in addition, in the paper, the proportion of gains realized and the proportion of losses realized are not only aggregated across investors, they're also aggregated across time. So notice here, I implicitly gave you just one time period. You know, so this is today. This is what these guys did today. But if you were actually recreating the paper, you would take the proportion of gains realized as the number of gains sold across investors across the entire sample time divided by those realized gains plus the paper gains. So we're aggregating in the paper itself in two ways, and we'll talk about the implications of that. All right. So let's do our PLR. This is the number of losses sold. How many, lo how many losses did, how many losers did we sell? Three. Right. three. One, two, three. Easy. Three over three plus one, two, three. Three, four, five. So this is 
three out of eight, or is it 0.375? Mm -hmm. I'm old enough that they used to ask, this is less true because, you know, calculators and the decimal system and all sorts of fun stuff, but it used to be true that when you would go for trading interviews, they would give you these like fast paced questions about like, what's one eighth in decimal? And you're just like, ah, why would anyone ever need to know that? Except for the fact that, you know, old school stock quotes are in eighths and sixteenths and stuff like that. So people would like actually sit there and memorize like, you know, for example, what three eighths would be. I cheated here. Like I'm like, all right, point one, two, five times three. So it's like point three six, carry the one, point three okay. But that that used to be a thing, fun fact. Okay. Is this evidence for the disposition effect? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, why? Because um, the PGR is greater than uh, PLR, so that means that people tend to hold on to losers much longer. It's not that they hold them on to them much longer. We don't specifically know that, but that it seems like there's some bias against the losers being sold and towards the winners being sold. And here, we can't really do a test of statistical significance. I didn't expect you to get that far, so don't feel bad if you stopped here. That we said you know, our fundamental test is that we can say there's evidence for the disposition effect if there's evidence that PGR is greater than PLR. Other questions on this? Because as a mathematical exercise, this is pretty easy, right? That the point of this is not so much to say, hey, let's do some complicated math, but to really think about what this represents, whether this is a calculation that makes sense, how this fits back to this idea of loss aversion. And it's a more conceptual thing. I'm giving you some numerical examples so that we can put a little bit more concreteness on those concepts because some people respond very well to that.